Well, hey, good afternoon, everybody. It's, uh, it's great to see you all. Yeah, thank you all very much for coming out to this uh, writing and publication workshop. So for, for a bit of context, uh, when I took command here uh, July 17th, uh, talked to the faculty, talked to the staff, and I said, you know, we really need to up our game in writing. We had received this word from the chairman of the Joint Chiefs, we knew some of the other war colleges, that everyone was really wanting to challenge our students to elevate our game uh, with writing. I'm very happy to report that last week I was talking to Dr. McKenzie, the chair of our faculty council. Where's, where where you got Lauren? Now there you are back there. And you know, I've been asking to see what the faculty's you know writing, what they're publishing out there, and I've been getting you know links to articles, I've been getting snippets, I've bought a couple of books. Lauren kind of compiled everything that's been written by the Marine Corps University faculty over the past six months, just published, published within the past six months. It's a page and a half of scholarly journals, books, articles, you know, War on the Rocks pieces. It's just very, very impressive. Uh, again, but what the faculty here at Marine Corps University is doing is showing how we you, the faculty, are contributing to scholarship and getting their ideas out there. And of course, it's no surprise when you see this level of productivity and curiosity and writing from the faculty, we're seeing a very positive response from the students. You know, I just got uh, an email from Val on the winners to the uh, essay contest that we just sponsored. So we're going to present those uh, awards on Friday. Last year, we had, I think, 42 st uh, students enter our Bella Wood essay contest. Half of them were from enlisted, half of those entries were enlisted Marines. This year, if you look at who the top two Second Ave Innovation Scholar Awards were, they were two EWS students. If you look in this month's issue of the Gazette, you're going to see articles from EWS students. If you look in last month's proceedings, you're going to see articles there from MCU faculty, Former MCU students, one by Adam Yang, who's sitting right there, had a good piece in last month's proceedings. It shows that writing, clear writing, good writing, writing for publication is a reflection of clear thinking. And clear thinking means that we are doing our jobs in the classroom, encouraging our students, inspiring them to think about deploying military power in creative and imaginative ways for this very challenging future operating environment. I said to some of you, and I know this from myself, getting older, that writing is in many ways like exercise. You know, if you have not been running routinely and keeping yourself in shape, if you go out there and try to take a Marine Corps physical fitness test or a combat fitness test, I know because I just took it this morning, you're, you're going to be hurting. But if you're exercising the writing muscle and doing it a lot, it's going to come more to you, and you'll see the productivity will increase. I really believe that's what we're seeing uh, in our students right now. I think that's why we're seeing so many students write good essays that are getting published, that are getting published out there, and I think we're seeing really good productivity from the faculty. The fact that we have such great turnout here shows that you all are taking this seriously. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for what you're doing in the classrooms, inspiring our students to think and write get their ideas out there, and I think we're going to have a great panel. So thanks, and with that, I'll turn it over to Chris Harmon. Thanks, thanks Chris. I'm the less known than the general, so uh, my name is Chris Harmon. I'm one of the brand chairs, and the Krulak Center has a remarkable lineup uh, for you this afternoon. So I'm going to be really brief and just make four points. First is to just underscore the, the last thing said, that, that we, we all write, we have to write, and we do it during much of our lives. And um, it could be somebody working on their first historical novel, it could be the colonel turning in yet another report to a very demanding superior, uh, we all write. And I think the act of writing and the discipline of writing is a highly effective way to improve our thinking. That is to say, we think so much about communication, and writing serves that end. It also is a great, a great strengthener of our education uh, and our processes of, of thinking. 
The second point, uh, and a lot of our speakers today will address this, is the, you know, the op-ed is not the journal article, is not the monograph for the Strategic Studies Institute, is not the book proposal. There's such a range of wonderful things for you to write and places for you to publish. And they have different standards. And the experts arrayed before you uh, for the afternoon all know a lot about that. And it allows us to think about uh, uh, our options. So my wonderful idea for an 800 word opinion piece may be absolutely a flop if I try to extend it to a journal article which requires a kind of substructure and development and new material emerging in each section and so forth. Uh, your thesis, you know, done at, at history in, at Duke or your MMS for the command and staff it might seem to you like a prize winner. It might be a prize winner, but it doesn't mean that it's ready to be a book, right? So um, I sent my dissertation from terrorism work 35 years ago to uh, Random House, and uh, boy, that box came back so fast, I didn't know if the postman had ever even taken it off my porch, right? So I was not ready for prime time, although the work was adequate for a poli -sci, uh, dissertation. So there's a lot of variety in uh, the different media, uh, and the media experts are here today. Three, be persistent. Uh, we've all heard those stories about the guy who has his 15th and 16th press reject his beloved manuscript, but then the 17th picks it up, and suddenly he's famous for 20 minutes, and he's selling. Uh, I believe some of those stories. Uh, persistence is what it will take to see your vision, your ideas, into print in a respectable place that, that you want it to, to see. Um, and people who read what you submit are folks, you know. We all have our mental molds which should be broken open. We have our prejudices. We may be looking for certain things that you haven't supplied. And so um, it does take a certain amount of willingness to have things turned down uh, before we actually uh, break, break through. Um, so uh, I still remember a, a, a grim day at one past job at the Naval War College where the boss said, okay, Harmon, uh, you know, your teaching's just fine, but you're not publishing enough. And I told him, frankly, I, I'm a bit mystified. I agree with you, sir. I've got five articles out there on desks in the UK and the US, and they're not moving, and I don't know why. And uh, he didn't know why either, he let me know that. It wasn't good. So they all got published within two years, right? But at that moment, I had no clue why I was dropping the ball. So it takes, it takes persistence and, uh, and of course, once you get just the one, it's a great thing because then you're not, you know, the major who lives in Arlington and has finished his master's and has a great idea and has an article on your desk because now that same editor is able to look at you on a new submission and say, oh, and by the way, he just published a book review in Comparative Strategy or the Marine Corps Gazette. This adds to what we know about him. We know, we, we've got a sense of his professionalism we didn't have until he had this new publication. So you can prompt, you can prompt a press with things like that when you have a success somewhere else. And uh, it will help them take you uh, a little more, a little more seriously. It'll help them think of you as a professional when they may have never met you. Last, editorial process. What a nightmare it can be, right? And uh, I hope none of us stand behind uh, the advanced degrees that you have, or if your book is about war, uh, the fact that you served in the field and you're talking to a guy behind a desk who's never served a day that a certain a modesty is, is important in all this. Um, the, the editors are there to help you get better. So if they find some factual error, you ought to be very pleased with them. If they think a certain concept is uh, dramatically underdeveloped and they prompt you to do much better, uh, they might be wrong, but you might be too. It might be that two or three other readers would have the same reaction. So try as much as you can to learn from the editing process. We have here um, uh, two, two, two men down, uh, uh, William Bynum from Brookings. 
he turned my last manuscript over to a couple of people. They did a great job reviewing it. There was somebody who always caught my attention because many of the questions indicated uh, real no knowledge on terrorism at all or its literature. And that's fine. And I learned a lot of things from that person as well as the other people at the press because whoever that was, I've never met them, pinged on me for lots of other things and found lots of other problems. So these people are there to make you look good and they'll help you look good. And after all, it's their book too. It's not just yours. So I always contrast that experience with Brookings, which I found to be wonderful, although trying sometimes, with a press I worked with in England once. They got in touch recently, said they seemed to be very flattering. They wanted a second edition or something else that I'd done. I don't want to work with them. Why? I turned in a manuscript to them before, and they did not do what Brookings did do. The editing and the proofing was inadequate. They misinformed what I did. They introduced some of their own mistakes. I sent them a letter right afterwards and said, look, please fix these things and stop the print run. They didn't. They kept print, same stuff. I'm open it sometimes and I get, I'll catch one of those mistakes. Not a good thing. I opened the book I did with Brookings. It's clean because Brookings cleaned it up. So they're, they're there to help you. And uh, if, if we all can be uh, patient with the editorial process, I think it's pretty good. So the afternoon is this hour followed by one other. In the rest of this hour, we have four experts in front of you. They'll at least have uh, eight or nine, ten minutes apiece. We'll try to keep, keep them on schedule. And then when they're finished, we'll go out and to the left and down to some breakout rooms. Many of you have a schedule there that shows you where, where you want to go, depending on what you want to talk about. Uh, Jim Robbins is here to talk uh, about, about books and op eds especially because he writes for USA Today. He's a former prof here at Command and Staff College. Uh, but then we lost him to the world of writing commentary for the newspapers. Uh, he does books as well. In fact, four of Dr. Robbins' books have been introduced to the C-SPAN audience <coughs> individually. We have Miss Angela Anderson. Uh, to my right as well. Chief Editor of the Marine Corps University Journal. That's a place a lot of you might want to publish. And a principal at our press here at, at MCU. I've mentioned Bill Finan. He's been an editor in many capacities. He now directs, directs the Brookings Institution Press associated with the think tank up the road in Washington. And of course, a very familiar folk book man on this campus, Williamson Murray, who is the Anthony Marshall Center Chair, Chair of Strategic Studies uh, here at our school. Now, all four of these folks will go on to the breakouts in the second hour, and so you're free to link up with whoever you like there. Also with them will be Dave Mastio from USA Today. Colonel Woody Woodbridge is here. Many of you know him. He edits the Gazette. And James Lacey, one of our prolific authors for the War College. So with that, we turn now to Jim Roberts. But it's actually it's one of the hardest parts of the process is coming up with a good topic. What's a good topic? Well, it's going to be something current, and it's going to be something that people want to read about. 
when I was writing editorials for the Washington Times, I could guarantee you that if I wanted to write on a topic that no one would read about, it would be Afghanistan. I had a background in that, a background in counterinsurgency. It was really interesting to me. I loved it when things were happening that I could write about and stuff. But I'll tell you, no one wanted to read about it. So I had to shift what I was writing about to try to make it uh, something that was more interesting to the reader. So it's just something to think about when you're choosing your topic. Um, the second thing is to make a point. Now, it can't just be, well, here's my opinion, here's what I think. Well, great, everybody has an opinion and thinks something. What you have to do is make an argument that's supported by facts. Come up with something that the reader is uh, going to find reasonable, that you're making a persuasive argument to them, not just stating your opinion. And don't be wishy-washy about it either. Sometimes you read a column where someone says, well, on the one hand this, and on the other hand that, and I don't know. Well, come on, make a point. You can't just, just tell the reader that there's stuff going on and maybe something will happen. So take a chance with something. And be original. Add to the debate. Don't just recycle what everybody else is saying. But try to find a unique angle. Come up with something that people will go, huh, I never thought about it that way before. That's very effective. Do your homework. This is something that I think academics have a, a competitive advantage on, is actually doing some research and looking stuff up. There are a lot of non-facts out there, and there are a lot of things that get people upset that are just based on someone's opinion or on something somebody said. But if you can link to authoritative sources, link to actual evidence, it really strengthens your hand, uh, particularly if you're just trying to be reasonable about something. You're also advantaged by the fact that many reporters are either lazy or they don't have the knowledge of how to do real in-depth research. They don't know where to go to look stuff up. They just base what they're doing on a quote somebody gave them or uh, something that somebody else said on TV, things like this. And if you read critically in the newspaper, you'll see that's the case. They'll say, well, this guy said that. Here's a quote. Boom. And that's their evidence. Well, maybe what the guy's quote is is inaccurate. So if you have the ability to look stuff up uh, quickly and get it into print, print quickly, you have an advantage. Let me give you an example. Uh, recently, when we had this problem at the border in the south where tear gas was used against migrants who were you know, throwing rocks at the uh, agents who were down there, and there was a lot of press about this being unprecedented, this never happened before, and a bunch of stuff like that. Well, of course it happened before. It happened many times before. But reporters were not looking into that. So I wrote something for USA Today saying, well, you know, not only did this happen under the Obama administration, but if you look at the you know, training manuals and look at the doctrine, it's fully in there. We've had guys for the last, since the 1980s, who have been training on how to do this. And the earliest example I could find was in the Carter administration back in 1980. So it was just to contextualize it. I mean, however you feel about the use of tear gas uh, for border control, the fact is the reporting that said that this was some kind of uh, amazing thing that had never happened before was wrong. And so my piece got a lot of play because I was actually putting facts out there. And again, how people want to respond to those facts, that's up to them. But the facts are the facts. Uh, another thing that used to make me angry was when uh, in our wars in Iraq and Afghanistan when something would happen, like a car bomb would go off or there'd be an attack on a key building or something like that, you'd have some smart reporter say, well, you know what, this is just like the Tet Offensive. This is just like Tet. And you'd see this all the time. It was so annoying to me, I had to write about it because, you know, the Tet Offensive had 80,000 Viet Cong and North Vietnamese attacking over 100 cities throughout South Vietnam with the intent of winning the war. So a car bomb going off in Kabul is not just like Tet. It's hardly anything like Tet, except the bomb went off. So I wrote an article on that in National Review, and that actually evolved into a book. There was just so much to write about. Uh, but I mean, case in point, you don't see that as much anymore. I think that the, the word has kind of gotten out. But, um, just a case in point. You want to be brief when you're writing these things. Uh, 
it's easy to go on, you know, write a 2,000 word thing, it's easier to do that than to write something that's 650 words, usually. Because, you know, once you get writing and you're kind of digressing and you're enjoying your own prose and you're adding in more examples and things like this, no, you have to just set a limit, 650 to 750. And that also requires you to be a real tough editor. You may have this beautiful paragraph that you wrote earlier in your process that, that you know you really love, and then you go on further, and your opinion piece is going in a different direction. You may look back at that. You have to have the ability to just look at that paragraph and go delete. You just have to like scrub it, and that can be hard. But you know what? It's just what you got to do. So you have to have the ability to be a real tough editor with yourself. Uh, having a good lead. It's very important in terms of uh, getting the attention of both editors and readers. The LEDE, the lead, the first sentence in your thing. It's very important to be catchy, because particularly these days, when people are doing this, you know, and that's the main way that you're going to reach a lot of people uh, on their phone or their pad. If they don't see something interesting from the get-go, they're just going to keep going. So try to have it interesting. Uh, a good headline also helps. But frequently, it is the publisher that determines your headline. You can suggest a headline. And if it's a good one, then again, you may stop people from doing this. Uh, but it's important to be right up front with what you're doing. You have to be extremely straightforward because you have very limited space. So I know that particularly with academics, you want to kind of develop a thought and you know, massage it a little bit and then come up with you know, your big thing at the end. Can't do that you got to put your big thing up front so that people know what you're talking about. You can develop it more later, but you got to get people's attention. Uh, also, don't think that people are going to read the whole thing. Some people just read a few paragraphs and move on. So if you can make your point up front, at least you'll get those people who don't read the whole thing. Uh, it's good to be uh, reasonable in your tone. Don't be like overly sarcastic. You see some of these writers out there that, you know, they're just completely sarcastic or <coughs> mocking or things like that. That's not effective writing. It may be satisfying to you to mock somebody, but it's really not effective. Uh, just try to be as reasonable as you can because it makes your argument more effective, number one, and number two, it's harder for people to contest you if you're just trying to be uh, Maybe they'll be the sarcastic one. Um, you can use humor in your piece. But if you're going to use humor, just make sure it's fun. A lot of people, uh, their humor isn't very fun. So, you know, you got to work on that. Case in point. Um, watch jargon. Even if you explain it, you don't want to, like, jargon up your thing. And uh, this is something that, you know, people uh, who work in the military or serve in the military, you know, have a lot of acronyms, there's a lot of jargon and stuff like that. Your average reader isn't going to get that. And if you have to take time to explain the word you just used, you're probably not being effective in communicating. So just it's something to watch out for. Although a little bit of that is good because it gives the flavor of probably what you're, uh, the topic that you're writing about. Uh, then have a strong close. You really want to close it out with something powerful if you can uh, so that people you, you really drive home your point at the end. You want it up front and you want it at the end so that the people who do read all the way down and read your whole thing, uh, they know that they're going to be this point. The how to publish, we're going to talk more about in the breakout session, so I'll just leave that for there. But once you get published, it's very important for you to use all the tools at your disposal to get it out there, whether it's social media or email list bugging your friends, whatever it happens to be, because you are in a highly competitive marketplace these days. Look at all the stuff that's out there every day. Thousands, millions of things out there. Who's going to notice your thing? Well, make them notice. Try to get your stuff out. Try to spread it around. Uh, get people to read it. Because if no one reads it, what's the point in writing it? And then, in close, what are your metrics of success? How can you say you've done a good job? Well, if you're satisfied with what you wrote, that's one measure. That's a good measure. Uh, if people read it, you get a lot of hits, you get a lot of shares, that's a very good measure. Uh, if people cite your work, that's also very satisfying. Even if they're criticizing you, at least they notice you. So that's a good thing.
Uh, you get a lot of comments. I don't consider that a metric of anything, because when you read the comments in a lot of articles, <laughs> there's just not a lot going on there in terms of thinking. A lot of them, you know, comment section, I don't even read it in my pieces. I used to, but you know, these people get into fights about things that have nothing to do with the article, and, you know, calling me bonehead and stuff. Maybe I am a bonehead, but I don't have to hear about it. And then, uh, but I think the ultimate measure of whether you do a good job is if you get more opportunities. If you publish something with an outlet, and then you go back to them with something, and they take it, and then you develop a relationship with an editor, or have other opportunities that springboard from that, that's really your measure of success as a writer, because you want to write something and then keep writing. And so the more you can publish, and the more you can you know, please your editors, please your audience, and really start to have a voice, then to me, that's the ultimate measure because that's actually having an impact. So with that, uh, I look forward to talking to some of you at the breakout session about more details. And thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Harmon asked me to come today to talk uh, specifically about Journal, um, a bit about who we are, what we do, um, some tips and techniques for uh, for young writers. Um, uh, the press actually falls under history division, um, which will be celebrating its hundredth uh, birthday this coming summer. Uh, the press is not. You can hear you. Okay. Uh, is, it, is that on? It's not on. I use when I'm talking to my 17 year old. But. And I'm short, so that I'll just stand like this. Um, Anyway, History Division is celebrating its 100th birthday uh, this coming summer. Uh, the press is not nearly that old, and nor is the journal. Uh, the press was created in 2008, and the journal was created in 2010. So we have quite a bit of time until we are up to the same uh, level um, and unique history as someone like Brooks or Oxford or Chicago, uh, but we're working on it. Um, when our journal first came out, um, and this was much much, many years before I came on board, um, it was, uh, the journal was just a collection of articles, a couple oral history interviews. Um, there really wasn't a logical thread be each, between each of the individual pieces. Uh, and that was one of my challenges when I came on board is, uh, what's our goal, what's our mission, what do we want this journal to be? And a big part of that was having an editorial board. Uh, we now have a very active uh, editorial board composed of uh, faculty from here on the MCU U campus, but also we have a couple sister campuses with the other services where we have um, editorial board members who were here and moved over there. Um, and they are kind of our, our guiding force, driving what we do, what our themes and topics are. Um, they're very supportive of our peer review process. So they're really the kind of the driver be behind what our press does and what our journal does. Um, every year they help us develop our themes. Um, and that's probably one of the most significant changes in the journal, um, not only in the timeliness of it being published twice a year, but also in having uh, thematic issues in addition to special issues that focus on, on, on trending topics at the time. Um, um, our submissions, uh, we always have open submissions, so there's no time that you can't submit an article, but because we do work on thematic issues, we do send out calls for papers several times a year because we want, say, our spring issue uh, to focus on the economics of defense and our fall issue of 2019 to focus on great power competition. So we will send out calls for papers specifically for authors to concentrate on those topics, and then throughout the, the rest of the year, we'll work to cultivate those ideas with the authors and bring submissions in. Um, the requirements for our, uh, our articles are just a bit more than the op-ed that was described earlier by about 10. Uh, most of our articles are between six and 10,000 words, including footnotes. Um, and we work based on Chicago Manual of Style. Um, so that's probably a 
uh, most students who are working on campuses now are used to that type of format, um, particularly footnoting, um, but that is something that our authors need to be aware of when they're submitting articles. Um, we do use um, a, a double-blind peer review process with our articles. That means that everything that comes in will be peer reviewed by it at least two subject matter experts, sometimes three, depending on if there are dissenting opinions. And that double blind process means that neither the reviewer nor the author's identity is known by anyone but the, author, uh, the editors. So any feed that, that comes back goes back to the authors in a constructive way, but also in a blind way. Um, as you all know, this is a very small world and some of the topics that our authors are working on um, are even smaller and Someone may know someone, and we want to make sure that we keep the process fair and unbiased, whether it's positive or negative. Um, and then uh, one of the biggest things that people tend to forget about when they submit articles is their part of the work is done, but our part of the process is just beginning, so you have to give us time. We know as authors this is your baby, you've spent a lot of time on it, and you're ready to see it in print, but we have to make sure that it's ready to be there. So um, that's probably one of the biggest things that we have to remind our authors of is let us go through our process, let's work with you to refine it and craft it and get it ready. Um, but it is going to take time. There is no magic, uh, you know, publish button that you can push and it's ready the next day. Um, so time is probably one of the biggest things. Uh, one of the things that Dr. Herman wanted me to talk about was some of the competing journals that are out there, and we really don't look at them as, as competition necessarily, um, simply because we aren't out there to compete with anyone. We are a, a government publisher. We don't uh, generate revenue with any of our content. Um, so it isn't really a competition for us other than for all of you out there, you know, putting words to paper um, and bringing in authors. Um, we're a tight-knit group, um, particularly among the uh, services who have publishing arms very similar to us. So if some content comes into me that I know isn't going to work for one of our publications, I'll reach out to one of my colleagues at, the, at another, either the, the Gazette or Leatherneck, Air University Press, Naval Institute Press, we'll reach out and talk with each other um, because we're here to grow authors as well. We're not just going to shut the door, thank you very much, we're done with you. It, it really is about growing our authors growing our community and getting the best information out there for our readerships. Um, I really like uh, War on the Rocks uh, was mentioned earlier as far as um, not just a journal but the kind of the changing face of what's happening with journal publishing. Uh, War on the Rocks was originally started um, as, a, as a blog but they have seen reader interest, author interest, um, and they have evolved into something that is much more of a scholarly-ish journal, um, and I think they're going to be one of those publications that will be leading the way for publishers like me and what we're trying to do with our content and our authors to get it out there in a much more timely fashion, but ensure that it's been peer-reviewed and all of those other best practices have been followed to get the content out there, but to get it out there faster. Um, and so they're probably one of those uh, peer publications that we look to, to how are they doing it, how can we do it better, how can we ensure that our authors are getting the best from us, but also the best exposure uh, to our readers. Uh, some do's and don'ts for authors. Um, if you're going into this type of publishing to make money, um, it, it's not out there unless you can, unless you can publish a, a full-length monograph once a month with a big publisher like Chicago or Oxford or Harvard. Um, you know, this scholarly publishing is not about making money. It's about sharing your information, sharing your passion um, with uh, with an audience like this or even with a larger global audience. Uh, so keep that in mind. Um, this is something that we do because we're passionate about it and that's really why a lot of our authors do it as well. They have some interesting information that they want to share. Um, some uh, important things that we have started running into, we talking about being able to fact check, that's one thing that we spend probably the most amount of our editorial time on is fact checking. Um, and it's so much easier now, even with the advent of Google Books, we can put our finger on 
every single citation that our authors are sending forward. So as authors, I urge you to be very careful about how you're citing your work. Do not wait until the end of your article or your monograph to go back and do your citations. You won't remember, you will not find it again, and it will make you crazy. And then it, it develops into a situation later on where either someone won't publish you because you're not properly cited, or you accidentally plagiarize someone's information because you did not cite it at all. Um, another big tip uh, that we're running into now, going back to um, how small this world is, and particularly for people who publish in the same genre continually, is self-plagiarism. It may be your content, you may have published it with someone else, but you still have to cite it in your own work. Be very, very careful about that because even though you may think you own it and own the copyright on it, for our, for our readers, they still need that transparency as to who the author was, where that information come from, and, and also giving some props to the original publisher of that work. Um, for us, because we don't hold copyright on our works as a government publisher, um, it's not always as critical, but it sure makes us feel good when people properly cite some of our works and other research being done. Um, one thing you definitely don't want to do um, is submit your work to more than one publisher at a time. I know authors tend to be very anxious about getting their work out there um, and think that if they just blanket the field with their work, they're bound to get more responses. But for me as a publisher, that's very frustrating. When you get a good lead on an article, you've started to work with the, with the author to develop it, you've gone to the trouble of finding peer reviewers for it, and then three weeks later, you hear back from the author, oh, I got accepted by such and such journal, I'm going to publish with them. Well, we've already invested a good amount of time and energy into that work, um, and it can lead to some negative feelings, and you definitely don't want to get into a situation where a publisher will no longer work with you because you were missing some, some of those professional best practices that give you something of a, of a negative impact on them. And probably the biggest thing for us, uh, particularly with our connection with History Division, is uh, when we see students and faculty coming in and out of here, they have wonderful information, wonderful ideas, they've had experiences that most other people have never seen or heard about. They're not comfortable writing, they don't consider themselves a writer, uh, they leave and they forget about it. And that's lost history for us. Um, I think one of the biggest things that I can say is just go out and write. Get, get the information out there, reach out to some publishers, talk to some other people, some other editors. Have someone co-write with you if you're not a good writer, um, but you want to get your information out there. The worst thing that can happen is you leave here, you leave your job, you leave the core, your service, and never having shared that information with someone else is some real lost history for us. Um, I think we're going to be talking about some other specific journal issues uh, in the breakout session with uh, Colonel Woodbridge, uh, so I will save the rest of it for then. Thank you. Chris, thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm the director of Brookings Institution Press. Our press is part of Brookings Institution. Many think tanks have, uh, not many, a few have uh, their own book publishing programs where they publish uh, material just from their scholars. Brookings Institution Press is different from the other think tanks. We're an American Association of University Presses accredited press. We publish not only Brookings scholars, but also outside scholars like Chris. Um, we're a peer-reviewed press because we are a university press, meaning um, the book manuscripts that come to us once we've decided to take one go out for external review, um, anonymous review, as Chris was mentioning there, too. Um, we do 35 to 40 books a year. Uh, majority of our books are on domestic U.S. policy. We have a, a, a good foreign policy component. That Of that foreign policy component, a lot of the books are area studies. Uh, and of that f uh, foreign policy component, there's a security studies sector, too, that we've uh, build up over the years. I'd like to do more with it myself. Some of the authors who've written for us and some of them who you might know are John Steinbrunner, Richard Haas, who's now the head of Council on Foreign Relations, Evil Dalder, 
um, who is now the head of Chicago Council on Foreign Relations, Michael Hanlon, who is a scholar at Brookings and is prolific. I have one of his books here, Beyond NATO. I have a new book from him coming out, as a matter of fact, um, uh, soon, which um, was going to have a title uh, uh, from Professor Murray, uh, alluding to Professor Murray's first, one of his first books, Credible Deterrence. Uh, we were going to use that title, but it's no longer the title. Um, uh, because Michael had a different idea, as he often does. He has an idea a moment. Um, Paul Pilar has written for us. Ray Gartoff wrote for us um, some seminal works on the U.S. and the Soviet Union. Um, the areas we're interested in when it comes to security studies are environmental security, especially climate change and its impact on national security. Uh, cybersecurity especially right now. Um, the Brookings Institution under General John Allen, who I believe has spent some time here too, uh, who's our new president, uh, is taking a real focus on artificial intelligence and its impact on uh, both domestic and uh, f uh, foreign policy areas, especially national security. So I'm very interested in seeing works on that. As a matter of fact, we just have one come out uh, by Amy Ziegart and uh, Herb Lynn, who are both at Stanford, um, on that subject. Um, I'm also interested in uh, national security policy generally, uh, looking at new ways of thinking about how uh, U.S. should interact with the world. We're at, 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 as, as General Bauer said, we're at this moment of change here right now, and there's a need for innovative and new thinking about how the U.S. relates to the world, because what's happening now is going to continue. Um, the, the, the momentum is there, and um, how, how, do we, how do we grapple with that? Um, I'm also interested in terrorism studies. That's why Chris's book came to us. Um, and also on grand strategy, if anyone has it in them, to try to dictate or uh, tell others how the U.S. should really play a role in the world. Um, always there on that. Um, also, I'm interested in diplomatic history because I'm a great believer that it's people who change things. It's people who make events. It's not just events that need to be looked at. So I'm always uh, interested in a memoir. I'm always interested in hearing a story about what it was to be the U.S. ambassador to Iraq. Um, those are some of the areas I'm looking at. I'm not interested in IR theory. I'm not interested in peace and conflict studies. And um, not really that focused on human security, too. That's not because those are under uh, un devalued areas. It's just that I can't go in that uh, direction very well. It doesn't draw on our strengths. There are other university presses that do focus on that. And you, could, you can find a place there um, if, if you're interested. So in many ways, I'm the, um, I'm the antithesis of the two folks who just talked to you. I'm uh, not the 800-word article or uh, op-ed piece or the 8,000-word article. I'm the 80,000-word book. How do you get there? I'd like to say you begin with the 800-word op-ed piece in many ways because you have to distill that and, and pitch it to me. Um, if you want to have an idea for a book, I, the first thing I need from you is a book proposal. And I thought I'd talk a little bit about what those elements of a book proposal are. And we can talk more in detail later um, in the breakout session um, on the elements of a book proposal and also the actual book publication process itself. Um, when you send me a book proposal, or to any book publisher, as a matter of fact, it should begin with a description of the book project. And what Jim was saying for an op-ed works equally well for a book proposal. Catch me with the first line. Catch me with the first paragraph. Get me interested. Why are you writing this book? Show me your enthusiasm. Show me what this new perspective is that you have. Um, why should I read this? And it doesn't need to be very long. It needs to be only a few paragraphs. Something that you'll find with editors is they are really busy people. Um, it's not because they're um, not unwilling to read what you're sending to them. It's just they have to read a lot. And they have to read it very quickly. And it has to catch their attention. So remember that. It's just too much is too much. So keep it as, 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 uh, as um, thin as possible. Um, and when you're writing those first few paragraphs, uh, tell us is it, what's new and unique. Is it based on new research um, not previously carried out? Does it help us understand? a conventional wisdom in a new and innovative way. What will be addressed in a book? What are the themes, the issues? Think of these as the first few paragraphs as a summary of all the work that you've done and written, and, and you're writing it to convince me now. The writing should convey your excitement, your enthusiasm, I said. Um, the next section should be a table of contents. This should be sort of an analytical schematic of the book. It doesn't have to be the actual table of contents. Just analytically, how are you going to deal with this topic? 
you're going to have an introduction, then you're going to have maybe three or four paragraphs, three or four uh, chapters, maybe five, then a conclusion. And it can be that simple. And it can just be a few, a, a couple of sentences for each of those so, uh, 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 working title uh, uh, table of content chapters. That gives me a sense of the breadth of the work, too, and how are you going to attack it. Um, a third element, and this is, gets to the logistics, is how long will this book be? Um, it's important at least for Brookings Press, that books be between 60,000 and say 100,000 words in length. What does that mean in terms of real books? Anywhere from 200 printed pages to say 300 printed pages. Um, anything longer than, in my mind, than 240 pages in this, in this era of 140 character Twitter uh, accounts is, is not, not going to make it. Your, people are not going to want to read it. They're going to be loath to pick it up even at the bookstore. So I, I always advise try to distill it down to between 60,000, 80,000 60, 80, words. Um, but sometimes some books have to be longer than that, and, um, and I understand that, and you can make the argument for it in your proposal. Um, also, at that point, let me know what's going to be in the book. Are you going to have photos? Are you going to have figures? Are you going to have tables? Are you planning to have appendices? Um, what are those visual elements that are going to be part of the book that helps us understand what kind of book you're putting together there? Another part. Um, that's important, especially for a publisher, is what's the market for this book? And that might sound antithetical to any kind of intellectual concerns for a book, because you're like, it's a great book, it has a great idea, what are you worried about the market? Well, as a publisher, I have to worry about selling the book. I have to worry about how to get it out in front of other people. And I also have to know how it's going to compete with these other books, too. Um, some of this will already have been provided in the introductory paragraphs, what that market is. Um, are your readers specialists? Are they going to be general readers? Does it have course potential? Could it be used in the classroom here? Could it be used in the classroom at any other university? Are there any similar or competing volumes? That's especially important. Name by title and author any books you may believe be similar to your book um, in terms of covering similar arguments, themes, issues, individuals. How is your book different? Ideally, a brief sentence or two about the competition might be helpful. Um, that information will help determine the market and also whether we really want to publish your book because a, Many academic publishers, especially smaller university presses, will be happy to publish a monograph that's sort of an additional grain of sand on the scholarship that's been there before. Um, Brookings Press, in general, has tried to do synthetic works, things that are building on other people's works. So I'm looking, we're looking for books that are trying to create, um, create new ideas that draw on other people's ideas and not just um, monographic works. Since we're peer reviewed, something that helps me too is to know who your peer reviewers could possibly be. I can't know, um, and, and this is true of any editor, um, can't know everyone who's a specialist in the field um, for your area. So giving a list of names of people who could potentially review the book or review this proposal too is helpful to me. Um, what happens with the proposal is if, if we're interested in it at the press, I'll share it with the rest of the editorial team. I'll send the proposal out for review. Sometimes I'll send it across the street to um, the Brookings Foreign Policy Program or governance studies to have it reviewed there. Sometimes I'll send it to an external reviewer, and that's when it's helpful to have the names of uh, reviewers from you. And then the last and perhaps one of the most important uh, parts of this is when will you write this? <laughs> um, the deadline. Um, a tentative date for a complete manuscript should be given here. Um, and that's the version that will come to us as a draft, too. Uh, I've, I used to do magazine publishing, and I did a monthly magazine, and deadlines actually meant something. If it wasn't there on August 1st, it didn't get printed. I've learned in book publishing, though, that deadlines are like the check is in the mail. They really have a tendency to just sort of disappear. And because uh, writing a book is, um, as Jim said, it's a, very diff it's a very different process than writing an op-ed, although I have to argue, I would like to argue that writing an op-ed is a lot harder than writing a book sometimes, too, to distill it down, uh, to get it into 750 words, because I know I, we try to get our authors to write op-eds sometimes, and it's difficult to, to boil things down. But give yourself a, a realistic deadline. If you think it's going to take two years, say it's going to take two years. If you think you can do it in six months, and you've already written an uh, initial draft, put it there. Again, um, it's, it's good to have a date there so we can know um, when this book might be for a season for us, um, when we could expect it, um, whether the book will still have marketability in two years, too. That's one of the things, too. Um, and last but not least, what's also useful is to have a sample chapter. Say you've written an introduction to the book already. That helps the editor understand um, how well you write, how you're going to tackle the subject. It gives some guarantee, that, uh, or helps the editor have some guarantee that she or she is making a good bet on this book that this author knows how to write. 
Um, and I'm happy to send our proposal guidelines too if you just want to email me afterwards too. They're very similar to many other university presses. And I look forward to talking to you later in the breakout session. I think, in the largest sense, um, whether you're writing a, uh, um, a letter to the editor or an op-ed, uh, and I write a number of them now uh, um, for Strategica and occasional ones sometime or else, um, or a book review, or you're writing a uh, major article, uh, or you're writing a uh, book. All, I think, basically have to run along the same sort of framework when you begin of what is the question that I'm trying to answer? What is this book going to deal with? What is it about? What are the issues, fundamental issues? Now that's in terms of a book. You don't have quite the same problem uh, um, when you get down to uh, um, op-eds. Uh, um, Strategic asked me recently to do an op-ed about what I thought about creating a, straight, a, a space force. Um, 500 words. I had a ball. Um, totally irresponsible response was, um, yeah, this is a great chance. There's another two four-star generals in it, a whole bunch of three-star generals, which we'll need for every command from the space force. Um, we'll have to set up a... Uh, um, a uh, military academy for the Space Force. It'll need a football team, which uh, um, obviously uh, Nike and the people who make football uniforms will be delighted with. Uh, again, but again, I was answering your question, which was, I thought it was a really stupid idea and it was worth uh, making fun of. Um, I, I, I think once you have a sense, um, and I, I, I've told some of my, uh, uh, EWS uh, rocket scientists, um, and they are rocket scientists, astonishingly uh, good, uh, bright group of people, um, that sometimes it's very useful just to say, here's the question that I'm, and put it out, and cut it out, and paste it on your computer, so that you don't forget what you're writing about. Um, uh, and that works for books, too. Um, now, in terms of trying to figure out what is the question I'm trying to answer, um, the book I'm writing now, which is going to make Cambridge croak, because it's going to be about 160,000 words. <laughs> um, um, I had to sit down and write a, a, a book proposal for, uh, but in fact it wasn't a book proposal, it was a, a, an attempt to, to describe for myself what I, a, exactly I was going to try to do in this book. And luckily I am married to a woman who's delighted at times to tell me that her Oxford PhD in history is superior to any American PhD in history, um, including mine. Um, uh, she ruthlessly went through it about three or four times, and it took me about, what, about a month and a half to come up with a, uh, a sensible, what's a proposal, but in fact it's answering question, what is this book going to be about? What am I interested in? What are the issues I'm going to uh, do, including an outline? Um, now, when you get to the stage of books, the outline is going to be, have to be adapted and changed. I had, in terms of the outline, was going to do one chapter on World War I um, about midsummer, this last summer. Um, I realized that at 80, at, uh, excuse me, at uh, 80 pages, um, and halfway there, that one chapter was simply not going to do it. It was going to have to be at least two chapters. But that's the kind of adaptation that I think goes through it, um, uh, the business of writing. Um, now, again, I, I, I would stress that whatever you're going to write, a, some sort of short outline, if you, even if it's, a, uh, uh, even if it's a, uh, an op-ed, is very useful. What are the major points you're going to bring up to support? your argument. Um, same thing in terms of a book review. Uh, um, what are the points you want to make? Um, and it, I, I write two kinds of book reviews. The ones I like to do um, are books that I picked up, however, 
um, and think are really important books. And then I'm really delighted to write a favorable book review on why this is, because I believe it, why this is a, but I still need an outline. I still need to a put down, not a very long one, uh, a couple of words here and there, sort of a list of things that I want to discuss. Much harder, of course, is a book review of a book you don't like. Because you better do your job in terms of underlining why this book is garbage. Which means you better do a lot of external reading to make it very clear uh, um, why you're warning the reader not to waste uh, his or her money. Um, uh, articles. Now, you begin to, and I think one of the things that, uh, um, if you do any sustained writing, you'll notice is from the amount of research required from the op-ed level as you go up exponentially increases. And it requires a, a far more attention to detail um, uh, uh, in terms of, of, of your writing. Um, I cannot guess how many books I've gone back to in terms of this uh, book that I'm writing now, including um, uh, one of the books I, I read, uh, not very highly recommended, I'm sure, in terms of the scholarly literature in the Second World War, a book on the dams raid, 1943, where the British Lancasters took out two of the most important British dams. There was, in the footnotes, the author made a certain amount of, of of claims, which looked very interesting. I looked, and the original documents that, that he uh, based his claims on were uh, in the uh, uh, Freiburg Military History uh, uh, Archive uh, in Germany. And I have a good friend over there who, uh, David Zabecki, one of the foremost military historians around, he went and he got the whole document. And what the document then showed me was not only crucial pieces of information like the dams raid on the Germans own estimate in the summer of 43 um, had lower German steel production by about 400,000 tons. Just that one night that cost the British um, about six Lancasters had, had a significant impact on it. Um, but there were also a number of other interesting things in the document because there was a report from the Ruhr um, economic uh, 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 district that um, um, uh, indicated everything that had happened over a, uh, a three-month period from January, six-month period from January to July 1943. Included in it was the fact that the first women workers in uh, the Ruhr Industries showed up in April 1943. That's a really interesting little sort of tidbit. The Germans were not using any women uh, in their war work until they had, to be perfectly frank, lost the war. Um, so again, I think part of being and doing this is following rat rabbit holes. And there is no person better in this room, far better than I am, than Jim Lacey up there in his capacity to wander around the archives and various other places and discover things that will really annoy a lot of historians who've been lazy and not done their job. And there, let me tell you, a huge number of them. <laughs> I don't want to talk too long because a lot of what I probably say will be repeated, um, but I think there's one a very, very important point. Whether you're writing an op-ed, a book review, an article, um, uh, or a book, and a book is always going to be a series of segments. Get your argument down on paper and then be ready yourself to do really substantial rewriting. Get rid of the passes. And I mean really, I have a stamp for my EWS students, the Queen of Hearts, in red. And every time a pass appears, the stamp appears so they won't forget what a pass of it. I see some of them smiling up there. Um, uh, uh, but beyond that, the, the, the sort of attention to detail, good writing is getting rid of lots of stuff, taking a 10, 12 word sentence and making it four words, shortening up your prose, making it clear. Um, and that is, I think, a, a very different process than 
writing. It's a process of rewriting, um, uh, and there, the crucial element is is it is putting your normal English that you write with, uh, and putting it into far more readable and intelligent prose, which then makes the editors of various places like Brookings say, oh, this is so wonderfully written. Um, which is, I have gotten into the habit of doing that. Um, uh, every time I finish a piece, an article, um, or a chapter, and it's now time to do rewriting, the initial thought in my mind is, I really knocked it this time. I won't have to do any rewriting. And then I start on page one. Because then it, after I've done the rewriting, I turn it over to this ferocious Oxford writing that I've connected with. We will then do some additional rewriting. But rewrite, rewrite, rewrite. That's the only way you're going to come up with clear, intelligible English. And it's worth noting that every single piece of uh, publication that Winston Churchill did, he rewrote. Now, in terms of nightmare for editors, he rewrote on the galleys. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I don't have any more to say. I hope that's helpful. Thank you. First, thank you all so much for coming for coming out. It's, uh, for, for, for UEWS students and for all the students and faculty, I, I just can't tell you how important this workshop is on writing and getting your ideas out there. As just one example, Right, this morning there was an energy symposium, you know, in the Krulak Center, and there were what, like five or six student teams, and they all had their ideas, and they brainstormed it on a whiteboard, and they were showing their value proposition, what their big idea was. So I was just going around, I said, what's, what's your idea, talking to a couple of the EWS captains, and boy, there were just some great, great ideas, you know, one was on the Commandant has this force on force initiative where he wants all the units to be forced on force training, but they're not playing energy, they're not playing logistics. So these guys came up with a way that was like, wow, can you get this in 2,000 words and get it into the Gazette? And I'm like, well, sir, I, you know, another one is talking about uh, base, you know, redoing bases, you know, or bases and stations for resilience and how to design them and re-engineer them for cyber attacks so they're resilient with so the homeland. So wow, that's a really good these are just ideas that would, are just screaming to be put in the Gazette, in Leatherneck, in Proceedings, in you know, Greenberg University Press. Just get your ideas on paper and get them out there. And these folks here are here to help us. So you got great ideas. The great ideas are out there. The country needs them. The Marine Corps needs them. Take advantage of the expertise here. Don't be bashful. Don't be afraid. Um, you know, I, I'm a veteran of the editorial process. You know, Chris Young and I just went through it. We had some stuff ended up on the cutting room floor. Humility training is good. When your stuff gets out on the cutting room floor, right, you can't get attached to it. It makes the piece better. It took us a couple of tries to work with Naval Institute to get it down to 2,500 words. But it ends up being a, ultimately a, a better piece. But uh, it's work. It is work. It is hard, humbling work. But take advantage of the expertise here, and thank you all again for, uh, for coming out.